Welcome to this special webinar. Um, the topic today is to uh, reflect on the on the short term and the long term issues we have to face in our daily activity. Since we know that we have the possibility uh, to treat by TAVI patients suffering from severe aortic stenosis, um, um, even though they have long life expectancy and, and they are uh, at low surgical risk. Um, so in order to help us to, to discuss around those issues and uh, to share your thoughts, uh, we will have this uh, afternoon two colleagues uh, connected with us, Professor Anna Sonia Petronio from uh, Pisa. Hi, Sonia. Hi. Hi. And uh, and Professor Lars uh, Sondergaard from Copenhagen in in Denmark. Hi, Lars. Hi, Nicolas. And uh, and my name is Nicolas Dumontay. I'm an interventional cardiologist in in Toulouse. So, of course, you're strongly invited to to share your thoughts, to ask your questions regarding that. And uh, we can directly, uh, in order to dive into, into this topic, uh, reflect on the fact that since uh, we had uh, the release of the last uh, ESC and North American guidelines, we now uh, um, have in our daily activity the, the possibility to treat such patients by 75 year old women, more than 10, 10 years of life expectancy, severe AS, low risk for surgery, of course, but also low anatomical risk for TAVI. Lars, do you agree that this is, a, a, I think, a, a real and everyday practical uh, situation that you, you have to discuss with your heart team? Yeah, this is a patient who is 75 years of age. So if you look into the European guidelines, she's just in between what we consider for surgical or transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Um, I think what we need to, to see here is not only her um, surgical risk or her life expectancy, but also if there's any special anatomical features uh, who would direct us in one of the other directions. Uh. Yeah, th thank you, Lars. And I think this is a very important, uh, very important comment and, and maybe the first major idea I think we would like to emphasize uh, during the next 60 minutes. Uh, that is... Of course, we have the possibility to treat such patients by TAVI, but we should not treat all such patients by TAVI. And it, uh, it's related to the, the notion, the concept of anatomical risk of TAVI. And this is perfectly stated in the European guidelines, for example. That means that you need an anatomical, comprehensive anatomical risk assessment, not only of the access, but also of the risk of coronary obstruction, of the risk of, the risk of mismatch. All, all of the things we, we're going to discuss during the, the next minute. So it means also that if we want to reflect on, on treating patients uh, by TAVI, um, patients with more than 10 years of life expectancy, of course, we need to think about short-term issues, as I, as I was mentioning in the introduction, and how to optimize the procedural outcome of the first TAVI procedure, even more than we would do in an, uh, a nonagenarian or octogenarian patient. And of course, we need also to anticipate since the first TAVI procedure, longer term issues. And this is what we'll develop during this, uh, this session. Maybe Sonia, we, we can start with, with you and um, thinking about optimizing outcomes of the first uh, uh, TAVI procedure, I think, of course, one of the first aspects of procedural outcome we, we are thinking about is the, the paravalvular uh, regurgitation. What can you say about that? Well, first of all, we always know since many years that uh, paravalvular leak is linked with the outcome of the patient and uh, uh, moderate or severe paravalvular leak were already unacceptable since many years now. But we know that even mild paravalvular leak can affect uh, the outcome, at least in some papers we read that. So what we need to optimize the deployment of the valve to uh, try to understand what are the anatomical features that can uh, cause a possibility of a valvular leak. 
Of course, new generations of the valve now have reduced uh, through, uh, through the times, the changes of these generations, the percent. You can see here that uh, balloon expandable valve had always a very good result with, uh, for paravalvular leak, but also the self-expanding valve have changed a lot. You can see here the results of uh, uh, most of the trials, and the last, it's the optimal pro uh, ongoing trial that is already on, it's uh, enrolling other patients now, but with the first uh, 175 patient had a very, very small percent of uh, two plus of uh, paravalvular leak. Now, there are, of course, some uh, um, patients where there is a risk, for instance, uh, uh, big calcium uh, uh, go on going on the LVOT can be um, something that could affect uh, the paravalvular leak. And you can see here that in a high good position of a self-expanding valve, you can obtain a very good result. But even if at the end of the deployment, the expansion of the valve is not sufficient, then you can sometimes postulate. Now, the percent of postulation in these patients is changed in compared to the predilatation. And some valves have a higher percent of postulation than others. You can see here this uh, nice, uh, this nice publication where, of course, uh, uh, most of the self-expanding valve have a higher percent of post-dilatation. But you also can see here that with the post-dilatation, you can reduce at least of one degree the paravalvular leak. So indeed, you are able to optimize the result, even when sometimes the anatomical features of the patient are not as optimal. Thank you very, very much, Sonia. And, and coming back to, to our uh, situation of, uh, of treating those long life expectancy patients, you mentioned uh, the impact of, of PV leak, and we had some recent data regarding mild PV leak at, and, and their, their impact during the five years follow up. Would you say that when you are treating such long life expectancy patients, your threshold for post dilatation? is maybe lower, but you would accept less uh, uh, mild PVD that you would accept, for example, in an 88-year-old patient? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I mean, mild, it's uh, like a moderate severe in a 90-years-old mm -hmm. patient. So you really don't accept. Of course, even if in, a, in an elderly patient, you would not like to have a moderate paravalvular leak. But a mild paravalvular leak in a very young, with a long expectancy of life, it begins to be unacceptable, at least, as you said, for these last data. Okay, thank you. And, and this is very clear. We, we have one, que one question for, for, from our, one of our colleagues, Dr. Mansour, who is uh, questioning something about the, the, the durability comparison between devices. Uh, we will tackle that just after that because we, of course, will come to, to that sub subject. But now, maybe um, with this clear messa message regarding PVD, Sonia, we can go to, to a, a, another issue that is related maybe to this uh, long life expectancy patient treated by TADI, that is AV conduction disturbances. And, and Lars, I know that you, you worked a lot on that, on that topic. So, uh, can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, we're talking about patients with longer life expectancy and treating these patients are different than treating an elderly patient, as we saw in the beginning of a TAVI program, a patient who's 80 or 85 years of age, who got quite limited remaining life expectancy. Treating patients with longer life expectancy, some of the, how should I say, Achilles heels in TAVI may be not be a major issue, but it will be if you go to these patients with longer life expectancy. Sonia nicely demonstrated that PDL can be 
can be an issue. Also, conduction system uh, conduction disturbance can be an issue for these patients. And um, we know that in the in the beginning of the program, we said to to get a new permanent pacemaker or a new left bottom band block was a benign complication. But we have now quite robust uh, uh, data showing that that's going to be related with a higher uh, mortality, higher rate of uh, hospitalization for heart failure. So, of course, we should try to keep the rate of pacemaker to a minimum. One way, and with, this is actually a quite simple way, but this is how are you going to position your C-arm in the CAT lab? And I think most of us, when we started the TAVI program years back, was uh, using a, a C-arm projection in an LAO cranial projection often starting up, but we can have this S-curve from our software identifying all the C-arm projection where we could have the aortic cost aligned with the imaging plane, and, and often we choose this three-cost co-plan at you for a start. The problem if you use this, uh, you may have uh, the three aortic cost aligned with the imaging plane, but you're going to introduce a, what we call a parallax in your delivery system. So you do not really have a good understanding how deep or how high are you with your implant? And we know one of the most critical factors for for avoiding um, new onset conduction abnormality is a high implantation. So if you if you do not have both the delivery system and the three cost aligned with the imaging thing, you do not have a, a good understanding, and you often implant it deeper than you actually believe. Of course, what you could do, because you can have two S-curves, you can also have what we call an S-curve for the delivery system showing all the C-arm projection where you have no parallax in the delivery system. So you can you can change your C-arm projection if you start in this three-cost co-planet view to take the parallax out. Often go a bit more cordial with your C-arm. And of course, what that's going to do is it's going to remove the parallax, but the price is going that you're going to do, introduce a tilt in the aortic annulus plane. So what you ideally want is to have a projection where you have the three cost aligned with the imaging plane and no parallax. And it's been demonstrated that if you position your C-arm where these two S-curves are crossing, the double S-curve crossing, that's going to give you that C-arm where you have ideal uh, uh, understanding on both the aortic annulus and the del delivery system, no parallax. The problem is that most of us cannot we do not have an algorithm which can tell us where these two cost, like the two S curve is crossing. But what we actually can do is uh, is that we know that it's going to happen in what it often in an REO caudal projection that has been, and, and also here down in this projection, and one additional feature is that uh, you also have elongation of the different trigger alpha tract. Whereas in a classical LAO crane projection, you're going to have foreshortening of it. So if you have it open up, elongation, you're again going to have a better understanding how deep or how high are you, and you can aim for a high implantation. As I said, um, we don't have the tools to tell us where these two S-curves is crossing. So that's why it's been suggesting to go to what we call a right-left cost overlap view. And you see what that does is going to do is it going to bring your C-arm towards an REO chordal projection. So we could not, maybe not going to be in a perfect double S-curve crossing, but we're going to be very close to it. And um, this has been demonstrated here. You can see this is a number of patients where both the double S-curve crossing was calculated, but also where the cost overlap view is. And you can see it's the same range. It's REO caudal for these patients. It's also demonstrated here in, in this figure. Um, you see again on this uh, LAO uh, cranial projection, you have the three cost co planet view. If you go down to, to the other S curve, um, again, you're going to have no parallax in the system, but then you're going to have tilt in the delivery system and in the aortic annulus. And you can see that the main information in this figure is that in, this, in that quarter here, in the LAO cranial, you're going to have a quite a long distance between these two S curves. Even though the cost overlap is not positioned perfect in the double S curve, you can see what's going to happen. The closer you get, the closer will the two S curve, the two curves get to each other. And thereby, you're going to, as I said before, 
have less and less difference between the ideal projection for the three orticos and uh, for the delivery system. One important thing is if you're working in this cost goal lab view is that you check that you're not going to be too high. Because of course, that's a risk that you're going to have a valve which is migrating or embolizing into the aorta. So what is recommended if, if you do the implantation in the cost goal lab view with a CR often in an RIO coil projection, before you do your final release, roll back to an LAA projection, check the parallax out of the system, and just check that you have the stent frame below the left corner cusp before you do the final release. Does it work? We did a study here in Copenhagen because we had a quite abrupt change from using a traditional or classical LAO projection towards a cusp ball lab view. So we actually matched our patients with regard to age, gender, STS score, pre-existing right bundle balance block, LVOT calcification, and bicuspid orsic valve. And we got 183 patients in each of these two groups. And if you look at the need for permanent pacemaker, after valve implantation, you can see here there's a 50% reduction coming down from around 15% of the patient needing a permanent pacemaker to 8%. So certainly, it makes a difference. So even though we are maybe not at the, exactly the same rate as a certain side, we can certainly come down to a rate of permanent pacemaker, which is very similar, and thereby also improve the patient outcome with regard to both mortality and hospitalization for heart failure subsequently. And again, back to your question, I think this is very important as we're going to move to patient with longer life expectancy. Thank you very much, Lars. Very clear, and, and you clearly explain uh, how in such situation of long life expectancy patient, you technique has to be uh, to be uh, um, um, executed maybe with more uh, rigor in order to avoid this kind of complication. We have one question from Dr. Mansour, uh, but would like you maybe. Uh, to explain further and, and maybe a little bit again the concept of double S curve uh, in order to clarify it for for our colleagues. Maybe if you come back to if you can come back to your slides um, and uh, they would like uh, they, he would like you maybe to to come back to your explanation between the S curve of the, of the analyst and the S curve of the device uh, when they meet. So, so you see the slide here. I'm just going to show this one. Yeah. Again, yeah. you see there's two S curve on this. You have the top one, which is illustrating all the C arm angulation where you have the three aortic cusp aligned with the imaging plane. There's no tilt of it. The non, the right, and the left coronary cusp in, is going to be in the same plane. You can also make a similar S curve for the delivery system. That's the bottom S curve. It's all the C-arm angulation where you have no parallax in your delivery system. And you can see if you start out in an LAO cranial projection, what's often going to happen is that even though you take the parallax out, moving from the top S-curve to the bottom S-curve, you can see there's going to be quite a long distance between these two S-curves. So if you are, have the three cost co plan of view, you're going to have quite a lot of parallax in your delivery system. If you jump down to the other S-curve, you're going to have quite a lot of tilt in the aortic uh, valve plane. Again, if you go down to this uh, double S-curve crossing, which is uh, in the bottom left, you see you have both the three aortic cusp aligned with the imaging plane, and you have no parallax in the delivery system. The problem is we do not know where this double S-curve crossing is. We don't have the software to calculate it. But again, if you go to the cusp OLAP view, you can see that's just next to it. So even though you're not perfect in the double S-curve crossing, what you can see is that now the two S-curves are going to approach each other. So the difference between having a parallax in your delivery system or have a little bit tilt of the aortic annulus is going to be minimal. So that's going to be an advantage to understand how deep you are because if you have parallax in the delivery system, or you do not have the three aortic valve uh, cusp aligned, you have an uncertainty of about how deep you're going to implant it. So this in combination with elongation of the left ventricular alpha tract in this view 
is going to give you a much better understanding how deep or high are, how high are you. So let's say you're going to aim for an implantation depth of three millimeter. If you're working in an LAO cranial projection, even though you believe you are three millimeter below the orthogonal, you may be often five or six millimeter below. If you're working in this cosmo lab, you, you're still going to aim for three millimeter below the orthogonal, but now you're going to be really going to be three millimeter. So it's going to give you a much better understanding. You're going to see exactly where you are and not going to be fooled due to this parallax of the delivery system or the tree cost not aligned with the imaging plane. Thank you, Lars. Uh, very, very clear. Maybe two, two short additional questions regarding this issue of AV conduction disturbances and, and TAVI in long life expectancy patients. First, uh, can you briefly summarize what we know in the literature regarding the very long term impacts of having a permanent mm -hmm. pacemaker uh, after TAVI? Yeah. I mean, we, we don't know all the details about this because we, we about half of the patient who's actually receiving a, a pacemaker after a TAVI procedure, if you reassess these patients a couple of months later, they're not going to use it. But there are some big meta analysis, uh, 8,000 patients uh, receive, re randomized, uh, looking at patient, mass patient, between patient receiving a pacemaker and not receiving a pacemaker. And you can see there's a clear signal that if you receive a permanent pacemaker after TAVI, you're going to have increased all-cause mortality, increased cardiac mortality, increased hospitalization for heart failure. And of course, this is not going to be acceptable. So, so we need to bring that uh, rate of uh, new permanent pacemaker down if we want to address patients with longer life expectancy. Yeah, very clear. So if I understand a, a kind of signal showing that what was considered benign on a 88 year old patient after TAVI might not be benign on a patient having uh, more than 10 years of life expectancy. And no. directly related to that signal, uh, and uh, thinking about our heart team discussion, everyday heart team discussion, because here again, we are discussing about uh, orienting the patient towards surgery or TAVI, patients who are at low risk for surgery and low anatomical risk for TAVI and who have long life ex expectancy. So in your decision-making process, if a patient is at low risk for both procedures regarding anatomy, but as maybe a right bundle branch block, so a factor that is a highly predictive of permanent pacemaker after TAVI, mm -hmm. can it be in your practice something that will make you orient the patient rather towards surgery rather than TAVI uh, because of this consideration of long, uh, long term consequences of pacemaker? It could be, and it could also be that you, you're going to be, give the patient a CRT device uh, to try to resynchronize it. But again, it, it's, it's, Nicholas, it's, it's a very complex decision to, to make a decision yeah. for these patients with longer life expectancy who can both go for surgery and transcatheter or valve replacement. We have touched on already what is, what is the risk of parvalvular leak, which can have an impact on the outcome. What is the risk of new onset conduction abnormality? We are going to discuss later on what is the durability of this valve, what is the possibility to, to actually to revalve uh, the valve when they're going to fail, whether it's a surgical or a transcatheter, biostatic or orthopedic valve. We're also going to talk about what is the possibility to, to access the coronary arteries afterwards. So I don't think you can identify one factor which is going to dictate what's the best treatment for, for all patients. You need to look at each individual patient and taking all these issues into consideration when you in the heart team, try to make your best recommendation to the patient what you think will be the optimal lifelong treatment. And, uh, and, uh, and last, also last question, um, Dr. Lawton, who is connected with us, would like to, to hear uh, your thoughts about um, the, uh, the utility of uh, uh, image fusion and DCT plus CAT lab. Uh, in order to optimize uh, our uh, implantation views and, uh, and finally our outcomes during TAVI procedure? Yeah, I mean, I have, uh, don't have a lot of experience with fusion imaging. I mean, this is something we have been talking about for a long time and we have seen it. Most of us have tried it also in the CAT lab. 
I still think there's uh, something which needs to be optimized before it's going to to really uh, change uh, the way we're doing uh, about fusing on the on the fluoroscopy uh, uh, with the CT scan or with the echocardiography. Uh, so the only thing I have seen, if you're talking about conductance abnormality, is that some page, some sites have reported they can do an intercardiac echo, eyes looking at the membranous septum uh, during the valve implantation and try to guide uh, where you position your valve, try to not be deeper than the length of the membranous septum. But again, this is in selected patients. It's nothing we do in, in all coma patients. But there could potentially be something in the future. Also, we also have seen that software which can try to predict this device host interaction. How is it going to going to be not only with regard to, to conduction abnormality, but also to PVL, which device you choose, uh, which size device and which is implantation height is going to give you the optimal outcome. But I think it's, for the time being, it's maybe not something we use in, in daily clinical practice, but hopefully it will be in the near future. So, Sonia, do you have personal experience with uh, image uh, fusion and DCT plus CAT lab during your TAVI procedure to improve positioning? Well, we use uh, CT, um, and uh, it is helpful, but uh, at the moment, I would say only in, in special cases. If you have, for instance, uh, a calcification, something you want to avoid when you begin to descend the aorta and go towards the annulus, uh, when there is, uh, um, a, let's say, uh, something that is not common, then it's good to be signed. It, it is quite useful when you treat mitral instead of TAVI, for instance, to do the, the transeptal puncture that is straightforward. But uh, I don't think it's uh, the routine way of uh, using it. We need probably to be uh, to have a new generation of this fusion because the imaging is too fixed and the patient and the fluoro moves a little bit too much in compared to the CT image. Okay, and last, maybe last question, last short, short answer required for you regarding uh, uh, one coming from Dr. Tiberti, short answer for a very difficult question. <laughs> I have to say, not, not difficult, but you could you could stay during one hour about that. Uh, does the, the, the concerns uh, about the need of permanent pacemaker affect the choice of the, the model of prosthesis you're going to implant? Yeah, but again, uh, this is one of the concerns, as I just said before, also, what, what is the concern about PVL in a specific patient? What's the uh, concern about your ability and the possibility for re-intervention later and what's a, a consideration, a concern about coronary access. Uh, so I think all these have to put together and we have to make an, a, a decision for each individual patient. It's, it's hard to generalize it. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. I think we, we have some very important statements regarding this issue of uh, AV conviction disturbances. Again, coming back to our topic that is thinking about treating patients with long life expectancy by, by TAVI. Another uh, issue that uh, is coming, thinking about the first index TAVI procedure, is to have an optimal uh, hemodynamic outcome. And um, Sonia, I, I would be happy to, to hear your, your opinion on that and how you can uh, uh, try to improve the first uh, procedure outcome regarding that. Well, uh, reaching uh, an optimal hemodynamic effect, uh, it's uh, something that uh, can uh, have an effect on uh, the late outcome of a patient. So probably it's together uh, to the conduction disturbance and to all we have said until now. It is extremely important. If you think that also surgeons now look, for instance, the... Uh, area, the dimensions of the valve in a different way they used to do years ago. They are now use CT, they calculate the uh, area of the, or if it's area of the valve they are going to put, and they try to put the biggest uh, valve they are allowed just to increase the hemodynamic of that valve. Uh, I can show you an example of uh, two ladies, uh, uh, old, 
that have uh, uh, a range of uh, diameter which is which fits the same valve. They have a difference. One has a body mass of 23 and the other one of 33 and 5, and they both fit a 23 uh, Edwards. And uh, if we look the uh, the hemodynamic, not the angio, but the hemodynamic uh, of this patient at the end of the procedure, we have a good hemodynamic, we can say, with a gradient which is around 10 for both patients. So we would say when one was a small valve, the other one was a little less small, but it's a good result, we could say. But when you go to look the uh, pre-discharge echo, then things change. They both have a main gradient of around 20, which is something that it's not acceptable for a TAVI valve just after the deployment. And it's even important to see the difference that we have, first of all, in the hemodynamic parameters that we measure in the uh, OR and the ones that we measure with echo at discharge when the patient is moving and it's now ready to begin its new life. And another important aspect is that one had a very small valve, it was tiny, it was a very small lady. The other one had a probable valve that was small for the body mass that the patient had. So in these both circumstances, we have what we call a patient prophecies mismatch. So the valve um, decreases the hemodynamic capacity of the valve. And you can see here that, uh, first of all, both valves, balloon expandable, self-expand, they all look very similar when we have a low flow. And this probably, it is why when we measure these valves in the OR, the patient is, uh, has a little bit of sedation, it's, it's relaxed, has a hemodynamic which is different from the one that is going to have in the ordinary life. When the flow increases, then you can see the difference. From, for instance, it is, there is a further uh, increase of this aspect in valves that are annular position in respect to the super annular position. If we look at uh, the range of valves similar, for instance, we compare a 26 Avolute with a 23 um, Sapien, we can see that there is an increase of patient with uh, um, uh, an acceptable, uh, a very high, more than 20 millimeters of mercury main gradient. And these patients at one year increase again. And uh, we have a higher percent of patients with uh, an increased prosthesis mismatch. And this is very important because, uh, as I said before, the hemodynamics the optimal hemodynamics at the beginning will affect what happens probably in the durability of the valve in these patients because there is a stress of these valves that can affect the tissues of the valve even if they are re-endotelized. They create an inflammatory effect that is very similar to the ones that we find in surgical small valves. So they are the small valves, probably the ones that create uh, a higher effect of this patient prosthesis mismatch. And we knew this, that with TAVI, we had a lower percent of these patients compared to surgical valves. But now we know that if you choose a different valve in a small uh, analysts, then we can have also with TAVI this effect. There is a trial ongoing, which will be very interesting to decide if there is a difference 
in an annular valve position or in a super annular position, which is a smart trial. And this patient will be followed for five years, so we will be able to see if the durability of this valve are affected from this prosthesis patient mismatch. Thank you very much, Sonia. Very strong statement again here and, and very important uh, thoughts on, on that. But if, if I summarize and, and, and understand well for, for our colleagues um, what you, you said regarding that, that issue, it, it's mainly something that is related to our selection work. Uh, once we have selected a, a device and implanted that, it, it's done. So all has to be thought and, and predicted before at the time of screening of, uh, of procedure planning and CT and, C and CT uh, um, analysis and, uh, and anticipation. As you mentioned, there is, a, I would say, a, a common sense uh, practice uh, in, our, in our field that is to, to think that um, in small anatomy, maybe uh, prone to a, a, a higher risk of patient prosthesis mismatch, a supraannular uh, valve uh, would provide better hemodynamic. And we have some uh, study data, some registry data on that. But as you mentioned, we are waiting for a, a randomized uh, a trial uh, uh, outcome in order to have a clear, clear answer uh, answer on that. Maybe uh, um, one um, one question that is borderline with your your topic, but uh, that is the the, the question of um, uh, having or, or putting in in those patients with very small annuli, small bioprosthesis, elevated gradients. Uh, adding systematically uh, routinely anticoagulant treatments uh, after the procedure in order to avoid any uh, thrombotic uh, phenomenon that could uh, uh, that could uh, add to the increase of the gradient and, and potential future degenerations. What do you think on that? Well, there's been uh, uh, quite a lot of work looking if there is a difference uh, among the valves uh, in the... Uh, percent of possible uh, leaflet thrombosis. And uh, uh, the uh, some valves, uh, some annulus valves, for instance, for their reduction in uh, the, um, the sinus of Valsalva part and the, um, the amount of uh, blood that uh, it is uh, staying there, it is not moving, uh, it can, uh, they can increase the amount of thrombosis. So there can be a feeling, um, a correct feeling that uh, anticoagulation, it is uh, a good uh, uh, resource to that. Uh, I can say that until now, uh, anticoagulation in older patients creates some uh, other issues uh, like bleedings that are increased in the elderly. Now with the younger patient and lower risk patient, probably uh, even the treatment, the anticoagulation treatment, could be uh, changed in uh, the quality, the modality of what we do now. Thank you, Sonia. So if I, if I summarize, we, we've, we've again, coming back to our topic, patient treated by TAVI as first intention, having long life expectancy. We've seen during this initial, uh, initial part um, um, how to try to optimize procedural outcome, reduce the amount of PVD as much as possible, post-dilate, lower your threshold for post-dilatation, post adapt your technique to reduce the risk of, uh, of uh, permanent pacemaker implantation, and maybe improve your sizing in order to avoid at the maximum the risk of, uh, of patient prosthesis mismatch. So these are the short-term issues, I would say, we, we have to consider thinking about those patients. But of course, there are more long-term ones. And maybe the first obvious that comes to, to our mind is the, the need to reaccess the coronary arteries. So Lars, uh, I, I would like to hear from your experience and, uh, and your thoughts on, on this uh, issue, 
how you, you, we can handle this situation in a, again in a patient with long, long, long life expectancy. Yeah. So, Nicholas, you, you know that about one third of the patient we are treating today uh, with TAVI got pre existing coronary artery disease. And uh, of course, also if you're going to move to a patient uh, at a younger age, there is certainly a, a risk that this patient is going to develop significant coronary artery disease uh, later on. So, I think it's going to be a must that we can access the coronary arteries in, in after a TAVI procedure. Otherwise, we're going to end up in a situation where a patient is admitted with acute coronary symptom and we're not uh, able to candidate the coronary arteries. I think that's that's certainly not acceptable. Um, we can divide all TAVI valves or TAVI platform into three groups, um, those with a low stent frame and, of course, an intra and a lethal position, and those with a high stent frame where you can either have an intra and a lethal position or a super and a lethal position. And we know that most of these patients, we can access the coronary arteries after valve implantation, but particularly in those with a high stent frame and a super and a lethal position, it may be difficult and also for some of these patients even impossible to do it. And this was illustrated very nicely in the, this study, the re-access study here, quite simple study, 300 patients undergoing target procedure uh, the operator was asked to cannulate the left and the right coronary arteries immediately before valve implantation and repeat that after, after valve implantation. And actually what they found was in 23 patients, 7.7% of the patient, it was impossible to access both coronary arteries. And out of those 23 patients, 22 patients was actually treated with the Ivalu platform. So for the Ivalu platform, it's, it's close to 20% of the patient where you cannot access the both coronary arteries after target procedure. So again, this is not acceptable. We need to do it better, particularly if you want to treat patients with longer life expectancy. So what is the, the main issue? The main issue is that when we implant this valve, if you do not play, pay any attention, it's going to be randomly orientated in the aortic annulus. And we can end up in a situation, as you see here on the left-hand side, we can have what we call severe commissural misalignment. So the commissures of these uh, transcatheter heart valves is going to be placed right in front of the coronary arteries. And of course, that's going to make it difficult, or as you saw in the re-access study, even impossible for some of these patients to uh, access the coronary arteries. So what we should aim for is to have commercial alignment exactly as the surgeon will do if he implied a surgical fibrostatic aortic valve. So the commercials of this valve should be orientated the same way as the commercials of the native aortic valve. That's, of course, going to facilitate easier access to the coronary arteries, but probably also better durability of these valves because you have a better hemodynamic uh, streaming through the valve. So how can you do that? I mean, it's been suggested that um, when you use uh, this Ivalid valve uh, to change the orientation of the thrust port. So when uh, this valve was launched by Medtronic, uh, the recommendation was that the thrust port should be at 12 o'clock, pointing towards the ceiling of, of the room. But what Gilbert Tang suggested was to change that to, to have the thrust port 3 o'clock, pointing to the left side of the patient, in order to have near commercial alignment for most patients. And he also demonstrated it actually have an impact. So if you have the floss port at 12 o'clock, you can see it's 40% of the patient who got severe commercial misalignment. If you got it at 3 o'clock, it's only half of it. It's 20%. So it certainly have an effect. But again, you still have 20% of the patient who got severe commercial misalignment. Same number as you saw in the re-access study where it was impossible to access the coronary arteries after a type of proceeding using the Ivalid valve. So what we should do is we should try to tailor this so we can get what we call patient-specific commercial alignment. And we just discussed this change in C-arm angulation from this classical LAO projection towards a cost ball view. This is introduced to try to minimize the risk of new onset conduction abnormality or new permanent pacemaker. But this is actually also a perfect implantation view to gain patient-specific commercial alignment. 
Because if you're working in this cost overlap view, it's as you can see on the left hand side, the blue eye is the C arm. It's the left and the right cusp is overlapping when you look at on the on your C arm, which means that the commissure between the left and the right cusp is pointing to the right of your floor screen. So working in a left-right cusp overlap view, the only thing you need to do is to position one of the leaflet posts on the transcatheter valve on the far right of the fluoro screen. And for the evolute valve, you can see that's a C paddle, that's two paddles on the stent frame we used to attach the stent frame to the delivery system. One is a C paddle, one is a non-C paddle. And actually, the C panel is positioned right above one of the leaflet posts, so that needs to be on the right on your floor screen when you work in a left-right cross overlap view. And also, you're going to have this hat mark configuration, as you can see here in the bottom of it. It's also illustrated here in a different way. Again, you see the Evolute platform, the two panels. One have a C. That C panel is positioned right over one of the leaflet posts. And you can see here again, working in a left-right cusp overlap view, you have the commissure between those two cusps pointing to the right of your floral screen, so the C panel needs to be there. So what you do is that you start to introduce your delivery system with the floss for 3 o'clock to have near commissure alignment, and then when you come around across the aortic arch, you go to this left-right cusp overlap view, and you try to orientate the delivery system so you have the C panel on your right of the floor screen, and you had this hat mark configuration. If that's not the case, you're going to talk on your delivery system until you see that it's going to rotate. When it's rotating to the position you want, you take off, you let the talk go, and then you can pass the valve and you deploy uh, the stain frame. And after the deployment, you can see here again, again at a cost ball at you, now you have confirmation that you have patient-specific commercial alignment. C paddle is on the right-hand side of the floor screen. Non-C paddle is on the left-hand side of the floor screen. Then you may say, if you use this uh, commercial alignment, of course you say you, you believe that the coronary arteries is taking off in the middle of the cusp. But we know that is not always the case. Particularly the right coronary can often have what we call an eccentric takeoff. So it's positioned more towards the non coronary cusp. So here you can see in this figure, ideal, it should be the green vessel, it's taking off in the middle of the cusp. The red ones show where you have severe coronary osteal eccentricity. You see the coronary is now positioned all the way towards the commissure between the right and the non coronary cusp. So what should you do in these cases? You can see how frequent it is. For patients with tricuspid aortic valve, this is 200 patients with tricuspid aortic valve, you can see it's 3% of the patient who got a moderate or severe coronary eccentricity. For patients with bicuspid aortic valve, it's even 7% of the patients. So for these patients, you should consider, do you want to use the cusp overlap view or do you want to use what we call the coronary overlap view, as you see here on the right-hand side? Of course, what you're going to gain on the right coronary using this coronary ostium overlap view instead of the cusp overlap view, you're going to lose on the left one. So you have to look at your pre-procedure CT scan, look where you have coronary eccentricity. If it's a right, is it dominant or non-dominant right? And then you're going to uh, just determine what kind of view you're, you're going to use, the cusp overlap view and the, or the coronary ostium overlap view. No matter what you're going to choose, it's still going to aim is to have one of the leaflet posts on the far right of the screen, and then you're going to have what you aim for. And then, you, of course, you have the issue if you're going to do a timing target procedure. I know we may be going to trust that in a, in a minute, but particularly again for the high stand frame with the super and leaflet position, when you do a timing target procedure, you're going to push the leaflet from the first stand frame, uh, the first valve aside, and this is going to be jade between the two stand frames. So creating a new skirt from the LVOT to the ascending aorta. And of course, in these case, in, in cases, it will be impossible to access the coronary arteries for some of these patients. What you, of course, can do in these cases, as we do for valve and valve procedure for phase surgical uh, biprosthetic valve, where we consider a risk of coronary occlusion, is that we can do what we call a leaflet modification, such as basilica. 
But remember, this is only going to work if you got commissural or osteal, coronary osteal uh, alignment of the first valve. Otherwise, it's not going to help you. So here again, just to summarize, commissural alignment is important for coronary access after timing, particularly as we're going to move to a patient with longer life expectancy. Start introducing the delivery system with a floor score at 3 o'clock. Look at the pre-procedural CT scan. Should you go for a cosmo lab view or a coronary osteomobile lab view? And when you make that decision, when you're in a left, right, in your implantation view, make sure you have one of the leaflet posts on the far right of the floor screen. This is going to give you patient-specific commercial alignment. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Lars and Eliana. I, I think we, we clearly understood how important is this technique of uh, trying to align the, the commissures of a uh, neo valve either to the commissures of a patient or to the uh, coronary uh, uh, coronary orientation of the patient. You beautifully explained that, but what we would like to know, according to your experience, is that in real life, in real practice, uh, how often uh, do you manage to reach that objective? We did a small study on, on three self-expanding platform, the Evolut platform, the Accurate Neo, and the Portico platform. And uh, there are two features which needs to be fulfilled in order to obtain that. First of all, it should be easy to identify the leaflet post on the stent frame. It's actually quite easy on the Evolut platform and also on the Accurate Neo platform, whereas for the Portico platform, for the time being, it's quite difficult to see the leaflet post. The second thing which needs to be fulfilled is that if you do not have commercial alignment, it should be easy to talk the system in order to retain it so you, you obtain commercial alignment. That's quite easy for the accurate neo valve and also for the uh, portico valve, a little bit more difficult with the bulky uh, system from Evolut. But again, for, for the Evolut platform, it was around 80% um, of the patient where we could have a commercial alignment uh, using this uh, technique in a small study, 20 patients in each of these three groups here, looking at uh, the outcome using CT scan after valve implantation. And, and, and last, maybe one last precision. Uh, we agree that at the current time, it's not something that we can obtain with uh, the balloon expandable valves we, we have on the market. That's right. I mean, there's no clear mark on it when it's loaded uh, into the system. So, so that's not uh, possible with the balloon expandable valve. Uh, but let's see what's going to come out in the next generation. I think this is a, a relative new topic, and I think all the companies producing valve have a lot of awareness of this. So I'm sure we're going to see very, some very smart solution from, from each company for the next generation valves. Thank you. I, I think the last uh, topic we have to discuss Again, coming back to our situation, thinking, reflecting as a hard team on uh, what are the consequences of treating by TAVI uh, as, as, as first intention, a patient having long life expectancy, of course, is the need for re-intervention because we know, we know that we are implanting bioprothesis and that they will fail for sure. So if a patient lives uh, long enough to see this failure uh, coming, We'll see that and we'll have to treat that. So it's the, the topic of TAVI and TAVI. And uh, maybe, uh, uh, Sonia, um, I would like maybe you to explain uh, simply what is the issue with this, uh, with this uh, idea of uh, treating by TAVI a degenerative TAVI. Well, uh, if you see this nice picture, uh, Lars said before explaining the coronary access what it's uh, the issue of a tavern in tavern for uh, it builds it can build a new skirt and this new skirt it is uh, built by the uh, leaflets uh, of the first tavi that are going to uh, uh, put apart aside from the second tavi and they are going to build a higher skirt than the previous tavi so it first of all there is a difference if we look what is which is the tavi we have positioned for first if it is a superannular if it is an annular it is like you can see here 
and uh, a Sapien 3 inside a Sapien 3. You can see in the picture, in the C uh, photo, you can see that the nose skirt is going to be quite short. While if you position uh, um, uh, an Evolute in another Evolute, Probably the uh, first uh, cusp are going to be uh, overhanging apart, and uh, the uh, the frame of the second valve is going to enhance the height of the skirt, and we are going to obtain a very high uh, skirt that can reach, uh, depending on the measurement of the valve, around 29 millimeters. So this is something that we have to think about when we decide to put the first valve and especially what kind of valve it is best to, uh, to put as a, a second valve in a tavern and tavern. And it's not only the type of the valve, but it's been seen that can be also the position of the second valve in uh, inside the first valve. For instance, if we position, it is quite easy to position, like you can see here, an Evolute inside a degeneration of a Sapien 3, which is an Alunar, so the skirt at the beginning is very small. Instead, it could be interesting to position a Sap um, Sapien valve, an Edwards valve, which is a small valve, inside a super annular valve but not in a very high position because uh, there's been a very recent publication just uh, came out a few weeks ago where the overhanging of the cusp, uh, uh, it is not as important as creating a nail skirt positioning the Edwards valve very high. So this it is a, a very important uh, aspect that we have to think of what is hap going to happen. And it's not only the kind of valve, but it's also the relation of the valve inside the difference dimension of the analysis, of the root of the analysis where we are working. If the sinus uh, tubular junction is small, or if the sinus tubular is wide. Great, and I, I think it's a, it's a major point, and, and maybe last year you can add a, a few comments on that, uh, based again on, on your experience in, the, in, this, yes. uh, in this setting. It really means, as you show here, that when you're screening your patients, such patients, live, long life expectancy, you're thinking about your first implants, but you're thinking about a potential need for a second one. As, as shown in, in this uh, CT, and Sonia mentioned it, but maybe briefly you can again recap what are the, the aspects you need to, to look at the yeah. CT scan. Yeah, that's right, Nicolas. So, so if we know that all these fibrostatic valve is eventually going to fail, so if you're going to treat patients with longer life expectancy, these are going to fail. And we may, we need to have a plan from day one, how are we going to, to hand this patient when we need a V-intervention. And I think surgical explantation of a, a transcatheter heart valve is not going to be an option. It's going to be a, a tarving tarvi procedure. And as Sonia was nice and said, there's been a recent publication also from the group in Vancouver doing bench testing on frail, failed uh, core valve or evolute, where we actually revalve using a sapling platform. If you implant the sapling high, you're going to have this new skirt, which is going to prevent coronary access. But if you're going to implant it a little bit deeper than uh, the, the core valve of the evolute, you're actually going, still going to have access to the coronary arteries without compromising hemodynamics with the, with the leaflet overhang from the, from the first valve. So, so I think that's reassuring as we're moving forward with these patients, that if you're going to fail, and they will fail if the patient lives long enough, we can actually revalve them with tarvi and tarvi procedure using a self-expanding technology with a uh, a little bit lower implantation than the first valve. Okay, great. So, so I think now it's it's time for us to to conclude um, on on all what we've exchanged uh, during this uh, this session. 
Um, I think what I what I what I will keep uh, um, as main ideas is first, of course, it's not because um, uh, the guidelines say that uh, we we can treat such young patient by tally that we should. We have to remember that surgery is, is a, a very good option for those patients. And of course, TAVI can be a, even a, also a good option only if we have a comprehensive and rigorous uh, anatomical risk of TAVI assessment before orientation or allocation to a treatment. And of course, if we choose to treat such patients uh, with a TAVI procedure, we have to uh, work on our immediate outcome, procedural one, trying to optimize that. And uh, we, we understood listening to you how we can and how important it is to reduce the PVD, to reduce the risk of pacemaker, to optimize the hemodynamic. But we need to think about the future of these patients. So it means that we need to work in a fashion that will uh, low, uh, in, easy, and uh, liberal access to the coronary arteries, and maybe, or at least most uh, importantly, we need to think since the first index study procedure to the need to reintervene in case of failure of such bioprosthesis. And I think it, it what makes our work uh, uh, nowadays in the current era uh, very, really fascinating because. We have uh, um, uh, different choices available, and the heart team had to, to make a good selection, the right choice for, for our patients. So I, I have to thank our colleagues who connected, the, or connected with us and asked some questions and participated. Thank you, Sonia, for your, your participation and your, your very clear inputs. Thank you, Lars, also for the same, the, the clear inputs, clear statements that made things I think quite uh, uh, quite uh, important and obvious for our colleagues. Things, of course, PCR for organization and Medtronic for uh, for an uh, unrestricted grant for organization of uh, this webinar. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thanks, Nicholas. Thanks, Anya.